I wanted Judy to be here because I wanted to say nice things, but she's not here. Are we starting, um, Eric? Sure. Okay, we're starting. <laughs> All right, welcome. Welcome, everybody, to this lovely all fiction, mostly, I think, uh, reading today. And I'm very happy to be the MC because the primary. Oh, wait. Pardon me? No, he's not. He's talking to somebody back there. I will start again. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> Greetings. Uh, welcome to this reading. It's an all fiction reading, and I'm very happy to be the MC for it because the readers are my buds, and I'm so happy. Uh, um, and I'm also very happy that these three women are together because they all are extremely active in the literary community and uh, so active um, they're among the pantheon that um, I really believe that if people like Andrina and Judy and Joan um, did not do what they do you know our lives would be less rich and a lot of these things just would not happen. I mean, these are the people who, and I'm gonna include Lucy Day in here too, who's gonna read later, <laughs> who, um, who, um, who start the anthologies, make sure they happen, who start the groups like women's um, um, poetry potluck group. Pardon me? No, go ahead, um, uh, give, you know, arrange readings, um, our editors of this, that, and the other thing, and um, really, really keep uh, the literary scene going. And, and this while they are themselves incredibly busy, and I'm so impressed um, with what they do. Uh, so I, I'm glad that they, this is, an, this is their day. So I'm very happy for them, and and also because in some to some people um, this represents um, <laughs> hi Judy, this represents uh, a departure from some of the other work they do. So anyway, uh, I will uh, be introducing all of them separately, but I just wanted to say that um, uh, again that that is why I'm so happy that I was able to be MC for this because. I am sort of in awe of these um, women. All right, I'm going to read a very brief thing just to get my voice in the room, and then um, 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 Judy is taking my spot. Oh, well. <laughs> Judy, you arrive late, you take my seat. Okay. <laughs> Don't kick my wine under the chair. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, uh, Andrina asked if I wanted to read something. So I, um, all I have in terms of a book length uh, fiction uh, is online, it's on Kindle. And it's a children's story. Um, so I'm just reading the very first pages, two pages of this children's story. It's called The Stair in the Wall. And of course, there's a stair in the wall of the mansion that she finds herself in. Okay, uh, when Sylvia arrived home from school that cold November day, Papa Whiskers met her in the hall and told her to come into the living room. And that's when Sylvia knew there would be very bad news, capitalized. It had to be very bad news because the Corcoran family met in the stiff living room only when Grandfather Corcoran came to visit or when there was other very bad news. She and Momcoms were never allowed into the living room when Grandfather Corcoran came. In fact, she had never met her father's father at all. She had been asked, however, to be seated in the living room two other times. Once it was when Momkin's mother died. Momkin's had cried with great stuttering sobs and they all hugged in a circle, Sylvia, Papa Whiskers, and Momkin's. Another time a lady Sylvia didn't know was in the living room. This lady sat on the edge of her chair and her voice when she spoke was shaking. She said Sylvia had stolen her dog. Sylvia denied that she had stolen any dog. Papa Whiskers, who was a professor, paced around the room as if in front of a chalkboard and inquired then about the new dog in the backyard, a chocolate-colored animal with a big, wet, goofy grin. 
Sylvia explained that the dog had followed her home, which was true. The lady sat up very straight. I don't believe it, she said. Sylvia sat silently then because she had a rule of her own that she never answered people who said she was lying. What was the point, if they thought she lied anyway? And of course, she was horribly insulted in her innermost self that anyone would think she was a liar. So Sylvia said nothing. Sylvia, Papa Whiskers said, did this dog follow you home? That's what I said, Sylvia said, crossing her arms. She could be stubborn when she knew she was right and other people insisted that she was not right. I don't believe it, the lady said again. My child, Momkin says, does not lie. But the lady only glanced uneasily at Momkins, then glared at Sylvia again. Sylvia knew that some ladies got nervous around Momkins. Papa Whiskers said it was because Momkins was so pretty with her waist-length, dark curly hair and skin the color of coffee with lots of milk and sugar, just like Sylvia's. Momkins insisted it was because other women could sense that she was free, and because they themselves were not free, they resented her. Sylvia had not quite known what that meant, but she was about to find out. But first about the dog. Sylvia explained, speaking pointedly to Papa Whiskers and not to the lady, that the dog had come up beside her as she was walking home from school, wiping his slobbery muzzle on her skirt and smiling up at her. He had followed her all the way home, or to be absolutely precise, walked next to her, wagging his fat tail right into the backyard. At the back door, Sylvia had knelt down to check for a name tag on his collar, not only was there no tag at all, but the dog had seized the opportunity to give her a wet kiss. Then he sat down, panting with his pink tongue hanging out of his smiling mouth. So Sylvia had filled a pan with water, then gone into the house to ask what should be done. But Momkins wasn't home just then, and Papa Whiskers waved her away, busy with his books and specimens. So she had poured herself a glass of lemonade and gone out, back outside to sit on the porch and keep the dog company. It was only a little while later that she had been called into the living room and called a liar. Okay, so that's just a little sample. Now, <laughs> okay, first on our list is Joan. Wait, who's what? Andrina, okay. Andrina, all right. So as I was mentioning uh, about our pantheon of incredible women here. Uh, Andrina amazes me. Um, uh, well, I'll read, I'll, I'll read her official biography, but I am just so amazed that she could do, she's retired now, but that she could teach full time and uh, run the Women's Poetry Potluck, produce numerous books, um, and be editor of Poetry, poetrymagazine.com, all at the same time. So um, I do know that one of the things that she did, what she taught at Laney was flash fiction. And, and so she knows uh, what she, uh, of what she speaks in this new collection. And uh, one thing that I have I've noticed in her flash fiction is that her poetry so informs it because she doesn't waste a word. Of course, you don't want to in flash fiction, but flash fiction writers who are not poets can't cram as much into <laughs> the format as Andrina can, and it's just beautiful writing. It's, it's, it's poetry in fiction form. So anyway, I've done with my off the cuff, and I'm going to read the bio. Uh, her her uh, book that she'll be reading from is called Plumes. Plumes and Other Flights of Fancy is Andrina Zangwinski's debut, debut collection of flash fiction to which she brings as a poet a gift for diction, syntax, there you go, rhythm, imagery, and stories that do not shy away from homophobia, racism, misogyny, yet remain full of love and hope. Other books that she has written include Something About, a Penn Oakland Award winner, Landings, Traveling and Reflected Light, uh, which won the Kenneth Patchen Prize, and her forthcoming Born Under the Influence, Andrina Zawinski. Thank you, Claire. Hope I can live up to that. Um, 
I'm happy to be here today. I have copies of this book. It's only $10. I'd appreciate it if you bought it through Eric's as a way to support the bookstore. Each one comes with a little bookmark that says, these stories are true, except for the parts that are made up. So that's my way of saying these, these pieces of fiction, <clears throat> flash fiction, are, for the most part, they are rooted in memoir, and they, they comb through a lot of details from uh, real life. So they're 31 very short stories. They range from 300 to 1,000 words each. They have characters who are women, mothers, children, feminists, Me Too's, lovers, friends, poets, and they run from Pittsburgh to San Francisco, from Paris to the Yucatan and more. Um, primarily as a poet, I will begin with a story that's set in a poetry salon in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I was born, raised, and studied. Uh, this, I run a poetry salon here, too, and have been since 2007. Um, the title of the story is a word most women rightfully should balk at, chicks. Jojo, first to arrive, laid out <clears throat> compostable bowls and spoons, added ingredients from containers into the stock pot to simmer on the stove for the... I'm having a little hard time seeing this. Let me adjust the mic, please. Okay. I think... Uh, stay there so I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> Take this from the top at first, so you understand. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be okay oh, like this. Yeah, okay. I just quit. I was trying to get oh, the light better. That's all. Oh, Thanks. See, see. Chicks. So this is a story set at a poetry salon in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I was born and raised and studied. And uh, I have been, you know, running one here since 2007. Chicks is a word I never like being called, and I hope people will stop using it. Here we go. Jojo, first to arrive, laid out compostable bowls and spoons, added ingredients from containers into the stock pot to simmer on the stove where she stood stirring her signature pasta fagioli for the main course for the potluck. Anna was next, shivering in her faux fur and fast with her flask of Johnny Walker red, downing a gulp before unbuttoning her coat. Angie hurried to get the hot mold cider on the table on this frosty eve the last of the women's poetry salons for the season, with an incoming nor'easter predicted to bring a blizzard to Pittsburgh that weekend. Before anyone came, the new rescue dog threw up repeatedly all along the kitchen floor and was covered with hives, so Angie's lover Jen carried it off to the vet. She left the gate decorated with white balloons at the side walkway of the old Victorian ajar so that Angie wouldn't have to answer the buzzer or run out in the chill. The next to arrive and all at once were Millie with homemade biscotti, Karen with Mancini's bread, Demi with caviar from Woolies on the Strip, as well as expected contributions of cheese and crackers, even a big fat kielbasa and skewered city chicken. The kitchen filled up quickly with chatter and laughter, and the living room with pens, pads, folders as markers saving chair seats and floor pillows. The room soon filled with words. Anna's persona poem channeling Appalachian woman Hetty, Angie's Parisian summer sonnet of a trip with Jen, Jojo's Warholian ekphrastic, and all the odes to mill hunks and coal miners, steel city sunsets, even a rant called Chicks against catcalls and other assaults. After reading around, everyone lingered to discuss each other's work from imagery and rhythm to epigraphs and endings. That's when Jojo, cleaning up her containers in the pot, let out a yawp from the kitchen. Unexpected guests, 
Two men wearing side-slung Steelers caps swaggered in, one plopping down a six-pack of Iron City and the other of Rolling Rock. Chicks, one crowed. The other chimed in. We must have died and went to heaven, man. Nothing but chicks. Jen was just returning from the emergency vet when she saw these clearly drunken men in her kitchen and said, Oh, beer, our dear granny will love that when she arrives for her surprise. Birthday party, I'll go get the bows. The men hurried out the door and down the steps as Jen snuck behind to lock the gate after them. They snatched the balloons and put them in the six packs into their trunk before peeing on the walkway wall and heading off to the south side Carson Street bars. Barely able to catch her breath after storming back up the steps, she told Jojo about it. Jojo moved to the sink where she had been dumping scraps and was about to turn on the disposal, but she stopped short, scooped them up instead, headed outside, and pasted the cannonelli beans and dittolini noodles across the men's iced-up windshield in what she called her piece de resistance for the evening. And in just one word, chicks. <laughs> As we happily have greater longevity these days. It's many of us find us parenting parents and going through things we never expected to go through. Uh, this one is for my mother-in-law and it's called Dolores, A Large Life. This, this actually began as a poem and is a poem that will be in my forthcoming book um, coming out in September called Born Under the Influence. But it takes a, a, a larger life. Dolores warned that with the release of her memoirs, everyone would be flabbergasted. No one was. They were never finished. Nothing about the arranged South American wedding to a man twice her age, or affairs, and subsequent divorces and remarriages. Nothing of the perfume-soaked cigar she smoked on a dare from Castro on his boat, she calling him Fidelito, he calling her Lolita, Nary a word about the births of her three children, with nothing of the estranged one out of wedlock. She boasted paths two took were other than they were. Her daughter's military career became a San Francisco law firm partnership. Her son's <laughs> Afro-Caribbean band became a British Columbia classical piano concert tour. Everyone fell under her spell, enchanted by tales of youthful, youthful and worldly escapades. Even as dish towels were left to dry, draped over kitchen stove pilot lights. Even as a stranger smoked a doobie at her dining table. Even as vials of vitamins, oils, creams lined up to replace blood pressure and cholesterol medication, the vascular scar on her neck throbbing. All I need is a shot of lemon juice and clove of garlic each morning, she'd argue. As Dolores waned rapidly thinner, later revealed due to stomach cancer, she bragged she was as an octogenarian more fit than in her teen years, discarding bras, but not sheer blouses. Her part-time job fell by the wayside at her friend's apartment complex. Undeposited rent checks, undelivered eviction notices, piled up with her own unpaid bills and shutoff notices. And then she fell, again, and again, looking more like a battered woman than the wild spirit <clears throat> she fancied herself. Denying even more frequent spills, she told anyone whose attention she could garner that bruises were from forks and spoons that flew from a drawer into her face, or that she bumped her head, taking a tumble from a helicopter, until a social worker wa warned her to stop telling these stories or end up diagnosed as daft making the screw loose sign at his ear. Her daughter convinced her to go on a tour of an assisted living fa facility by exaggerating it was spa-like. And she seemed to enjoy the visit, tickling the ivories with Claire de Lune for a captive audience of residents in the recreation room. Yet she refused to leave her own apartment. 
A final fall landed her in the emergency room, their nursing home. Ill-prepared staff encouraged her, enter encouraged her entertaining fantasy life, but complained at her belligerence as she accused them of stealing the clothes and passport she needed for an impending discharge that was never to come. Under eventual hospice care, she muddled along, baffled by the ever-increasing distance between herself and the rest of the world. That last night, beneath a meteor shower, she fell into an endless sleep, head turned toward the window aglow. Her son claimed the ashes. Instead of dispersing them into her beloved San Joaquin Delta, he keeps them atop a stack of sheet music on her old Steinway, inside an ornate box engraved, Dolores, una vida grande. This one I think is more um, memoir than fiction, but well, there's fictionalization in it too. It's called Wayward. It was already 108 degrees when Valentina and I were dropped off at the Fifth and Juarez bus stop after an hour's ride from Cancun to Playa del Carmen. We plopped down our suitcases, we plopped down onto our suitcases and into our silences at the curb, both wondering where to go next on this first unscripted journey together. That's when Ramon appeared, offering us cheap lodging for the night complete with mosquito net patched with band-aids. We laughed at his joke, but realized he was serious. He guarded our tiny cabana overnight, sitting on a frayed lawn chair next to an outdoor generator from which ran an extension cord to the light bulb dangling from the thatched roof, <clears throat> a roof from which bugs with freakish faces dropped to the tile floor. But this story is not about the bus or the hut or the bugs or even about the erotic foot massage that Ramon proposed the next morning. Our first full day there at the playa, we wheeled our suitcases to the bus station's bag check, then took to wandering along the fine sands away from f the few hotels in the Sprout and Resort area there in the 90s, kick splashing in the Caribbean surf passing a few people other than occasional nude sunbathing Europeans. Just about when we needed a rest, we came upon a deserted ashram. From its courtyard, a Mayan boy emerged with a sire, dam, and their foal, offering to rent them to us for the rest of the day. Val mounted the stallion, experienced at riding and jumping in her native South America. I climbed on the mare, who barely trotted, her foal stopping to suckle every now and then, which was fine with me having grown up in the Rust Belt in the States. Just off the stretch of beach, we meandered through a sleepy village where no one seemed to notice us bareback, two gringas in tube tops and short shorts. But this story is not about that village or the horses or the boy, not even about stripping down on what turned out not to be a nude beach. Our adventurous spirits carried us next to Tulum by converted school bus. Some past riders' heated anger veined our window glass, and Val and I settled in to watch a doubled reflection of a mother with child at her breast, purring her name as Muñaquita Linda. At that, Val looked at me tenderly and said, Amy, my mother used to lovingly call me that too, her little doll. Now you are my muñaquita. Normally I would never allow anyone to address me by any diminutive, but with Val it felt so innocently affectionate and intimate. With a wink and sideways smile, I slid down into the seat to try to nap, but this bus had a bit of everything, from lovers wiping each other down with scented wipes to a man stroking his clucking hen, and then there was the driver reading his illustrated romance novel between making change and calling towns. At Tulum, we made our way through bulldozed paths, scaled pyramids in the sun, missed getting stung at pricey tourist stands by a swarm of bees. We also missed the last bus back. But this story is not about the bus, those who peopled it, or even where we would go next. Jungle monkeys barked as the sun set fast, so when headlamps came toward us, 
we flagged the coach down. On board, we headed in the wrong direction. We were off to the colonial town of Merida. I drifted off to sleep dreaming Pook Hills, a rain god's hooked nose mask, the pyramid of an egg-hatched dwarf. Awakened by diesel smoke at the dash, circling the bauble head of a virgin icon, we gaped at each other, wondering what would be next. Other riders stood to stretch in the aisles to watch the driver tinker with hammer and wrench. No one complained. No one asked questions. I got lost in a book of poetry about living somewhere else, identities hidden beneath layers of everyday living. But this story is not about the ruins or dreams or the bus we missed or the bus we took or even about how we would get home. This story is about finding a way. This is one of the, the few stories that's, I'd say, totally fictionalized, I think, pretty much. Uh, and it's set here in San Francisco. It's called Mojo. At Mojo Lounge, our apple teenies were tasty, but not as colorful as the Cupid doll draped in party beads hanging from a vodka bottle along other Crescent City decor in the city by the bay. The vintage Wurlitzer blared Tipitina's Cajun tunes with everyone shoulder bobbing and finger shaking to Dr. John's right place, wrong time, putting all our spirits in a good space. The afternoon was stretching long and lazy until a man, wide of birth and thin in expression, dressed in a crimson shirt with cleric collar, sidled up to us at the bar. He ordered the devil's margarita and introduced himself as Seth. We assumed Halloween being just around the corner. He was decked out for some event with his pointy incisors, gray widow's peak and ponytail, pupils ringed white. Stirring his drink with his index finger and lacquered gunmetal, he told us he was once stationed at nearby Presidio Army Base, where he had been a mind warrior. We were open to being entertained by some beautifully addled mind, bucked up by booze before entering the bar, so we leaned in, smiled, raised our glasses in a toast. Seth slid off his stool, looked us both up and down, and asked what with Dr. John would call a really wrong line if we were sisters. People often did mistake us for sisters because of the ease and familiarity that passed between us, and we told him we were sisters in the Church of Love, married, had been since Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and Doma had fallen away. Jolie knee-bumped me, then mimed a lip-zipper. He pulled a tattered photo from his snakeskin wallet of his wife Lilith, who held an uncanny resemblance to the Lily Cal Cal character in the Munsters, Jolie becoming increasingly fidgety. She opened up her iPad. Her curiosity peaked because she recalled when stationed many years back at Fort Baker that Presidio had been the scene of a black magic scandal with allegations of peculiar car accidents, sudden disappearances, child abuse, even cannibalism. She stumbled onto a blog spot describing the once Lieutenant Colonel's old house on the base in its heyday with white picket fence, ornate street lamp, eucalyptus lined walkway near a dog trail. The blog spot even detailed Seth's routine of propping his walking stick up at a mannequin dressed in SS uniform, Luger pistol aimed at the window, pentagram emblazoned on its stand. In the meantime, Seth, was boasting about his wife's underground yoga with exclusive members who practice inside an old fallout shelter <clears throat> tunnel north of Civic Center. Already on my second apple teeny, and as a yoga buff myself, I thought this thought this I bought the story having heard of laughing yoga in Berkeley, goat yoga in Morgan Hill, wine yoga in Napa Valley. I encouraged him to tell me more. Instead, he scribbled a phone number with his Sharpie onto a long leaf of stiff sage he plugged from a Nola blonde beer can, doubling as a vase on the bar, slid it to me, then waved to the barkeep for another drink. That's when I phoned my hipster son, who always seemed to know something about anything offbeat in and about the city. 
It turned out he had palled around with a guy who explores and documents city tunnels. My son found the yoga studio, studio story unlikely because his buddy had difficulty gaining entry to tunnels he'd photographed. Said they were terribly dark, frigid with water seepage, oftentimes littered with hypodermic needles and liquor bottles. Not a place to roll out the mat for asanas and to say namaste. In his usual dry wit, he said, I could put an end to being a freak magnet if I stopped talking to weirdos in creepy joints. Just as I was ending the call, Seth slid off his stool and onto a younger woman sporting a fade and purple-tinged pompadour who had cozied in at the end of the bar with a draft and book of Dracula fan fiction. Jolie seized the moment to mouth, let's go. I plunked some quarters into the jukebox slot and punched buttons for the Dixie Cups, Ico Ico. We chimed in on, look at my king all dressed in red, Ico Ico Ane. I bet you five dollars will kill you dead, Giacomo Finane. <laughs> then, with our arms around each other's waist and lady luck at our backs, we tipsy two-stepped right out Mojo's door. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. And I, I'm sure you know there really was a high-ranking army officer who was a Satanist. Mm -hmm. you, That's him. That's him. Yeah. Aquino. Oh, see? Colonel, yeah. Colonel Aquino. What was his name? Colonel Aquino. Yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting. OK. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to follow you around to bars. <laughs> Next up is Joan Gelfand, and Joan and I, at our last meeting, which was a long time ago, found out we had something in common, which was a love of dreams and dream analysis. And um, I've been doing that for decades, and I'm sure you have too. And uh, what was her name, Kelly? Kelly Sullivan Walton. Yes, she got me on her radio show. It was so fascinating. So anyway, that's another side of Joan you may not know about. Um, I'm going to read the bio. Um, Joan Gelfand's debut novel is Extreme from Blue Light Press. It's set in a Silicon Valley gaming startup with a keen eye on women in the tech industry. Um, winner of the Servina Barva and Schaffen Fiction Awards, Gelfand has also authored three poetry collections, including The Long Blue Room, a chapbook of short fiction, and the instructional You Can Be a Winning Writer. Her reviews, stories, essays, and poetry have appeared in national and international literary journals and magazines. Joan. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you to Eric. And this is the uh, first IRL reading of ex from Extreme. Um, I my book came out at the height of the pandemic in uh, 2020, and I did some Zoom events, but I've never been able to read in public. So I'm really excited about that. I'm going to read two short pieces from the book, and I have to, of course, set up this scene because it's smack in the middle of the book. So um, Hope Elson is the main character in this book. She's the, a non-tech worker in a tech startup. Her ex is Doug Weiser, who is an exceptional engineer. Some of you know where that inspiration came from. Um, and they've had a steamy affair in the past. Doug is on retirement when uh, Hope calls him to come into this new uh, startup that she's been recruited for that's working uh, in, in the space of extreme sports. So that's kind of the backstory. Um, her past, which is going to come up in this little section, is that she grew up working class in the Livermore Valley. Her very smart father, uh, who she was very attached to, 
kind of disappeared off the scene about 10 years ago, but in this scene, he has recently reappeared. Uh, she's very stressed because the startup is facing a launch and they're behind in everything. They're behind in the tech, they're behind in their numbers. And I'll just tell you a few of the key people's names so you'll recognize them. Charlene is her mom. Kelly is a, a colleague. James is her boyfriend. And Arthur is her boss. And when we meet her in this scene, she's in the gym, uh, supposed to go home and work for the evening to, you know, kind of do homework, where she runs into a colleague who uh, triggers her very badly. Um, and we are going to start right here. Okay. Peeling off her wet t-shirt and bra in the locker room, Hope pinches a last inch of tenacious belly fat. By next week, she should be free of these last stubborn pounds. She heads for the shower, quickly drawing the curtain closed before making eye contact with Sherry, Manuserve's accounts payable manager. Sherry is famous for igniting the grapevine. A C-list blogger, she is a take-no-prisoner snoop, always asking directly about Hope's prospects or the increase in salary she had won by job hopping. She prides herself on having the scoop. Hope can't abide her. Hope rubs her aching 50 ab crunches belly, wishing she could just soap the pounds away. All at once, the jet lag from three back-to-back -back meetups in Brooklyn, Austin, and L.A. hits her. Sleep. She needs sleep. In no mood for Snoopy Sherry, she slips behind the curtain of the private changing area to dry off. She'll skip dinner. That should move the diet along. No more regrets. Pulling a clean t-shirt over her head, a wave of sadness shoots up her center, a hot poker of pain. Hope scours her mind like a beachcomber with a metal detector. Shouldn't she be happy? Isn't the first month on a new job the honeymoon? The power struggle with Kelly is wearing on her, but she's a pro. She knows it isn't personal. Stand your ground, Richard taught her when Charlene harassed her about spending more time with her books than the boys. Hope perches on the edge of a wooden stool, bending over to zip up her shorty boots. Something is breaking. Behind the curtain, alone in the changing room, her throat tightens. James was acting proprietary, and Arthur's been distant. Maybe that's why she's sad. The men in her life were either acting like they owned her or that she didn't exist. Slouched against the changing room wall, Hope resists a chokehold of sadness until tears surface from a deep well. If only the tears were for work. But no, the tears stream for her past and worse, for her future. Will she ever fit in? Do her dark Livermore roots show? Her made-up life takes so much effort. When co-workers talk about playing rugby or going to raves or theater or opera, she's on guard, ready to change the conversation. Love those giants. No one would ever suspect that she had erased the pain of her childhood, the, pr the pressure of student loans, or never having a parent at parents' night. And now, Richard Elson reappears. Was it beyond cruel to put her father off? What if his appearance is a fluke and he's just passing through town on his way? To where? Australia? China? What if she's missing an opportunity to find out why he left? Remembering Sherry just beyond the privacy curtain, she picks up a damp towel, silencing racking sobs. Leaving, staying, did it really matter? Work went on without you, life went on without you. Hope zips up her size six pants and slips into her Armani leather jacket she splurged on the day that Arthur sent her her offer. Unanswered emails, unwritten reports blast through her funk like multicolored confetti shooting out of a cannon. Reports rallying groups to post videos for Doug's first load test. Kelly wants a response to her revised deadline ASAP. Arthur wants the latest blog post and analytics report. She grabs an iced tea from the club cafe, black, no sugar, just the right amount of caffeine to get her through the night's work, but not enough to keep her up all night. 
But back on the road between Redwood Shores and B Street, her enthusiasm for work evaporates like steam from a whistling kettle. Ambition, her benevolent angel, an angel with a capital A that has been tracking over the crown of her head, has flown the coop. Work, fights, burn bridges, nasty ex-colleagues, the test, emails, Arthur, Kelly, get over yourself, Hope. She hears Carlos quoting Ananda, his favorite yogi. There is no life without discipline. Okay, I'll do everything. I'll go home. I'll write that fucking status report for Kelly. Waiting for the light to change, Hope's nascent resolution turns into slippery ice she can't skate on. She hears Charlene home after a long day of work. Girls, you are getting on my last nerve. And James insisting that she tells Charlene that her father has gotten in touch. I will, she promises. The light turns. Gunning the car through the intersection, her eyes blur with tears. Freaking Charlene, could it really be that no matter where or how hard she runs, her mother will always haunt her? And that no matter how far she gets from that acrid Livermore Valley, no matter how far she moves up the hierarchy, the ladder, the food chain, or how much she has in the bank, she can't trust that she won't have this sudden, unannounced pull back to her past and the memory of Charlene's denigration. Now tell me, how are you going to afford that, Hope Elson? The night the acceptance from Berkeley came in the mail, Charlene turned to wash the dinner dishes. Her mother railed, you up at UC Berkeley, four years for college, and then under her breath, for what, to prove you're better than me? Driving past the marquee on the Alhambra Theater, a faux Spanish revival on El Camino, she sees black two-foot-high letters spelling out, I am love. The words call to her like chocolate cake calls to chocoholics. Who is love? And which filmmaker would have the audacity to proclaim it? Who cares? It sounds like a secret she can't wait to hear. She jerks the steering wheel into the Alhambra spacious parking lot. Tossing her gym bag in the trunk, her cell phone rings. Doll. Same moi, Hope answers as guiltily as if she were heading for a peep show and not a fine art movie. Quick question. I know it's your work at home night, James says. Hope stands in the cooling dusk. The boss just handed me two tickets for the Giants tomorrow. You free? Hope does a mental scan of her calendar. Her evening is free, but she's got the load test, and, be and she's behind on getting their numbers up. And besides, there's the work from tonight that she is ditching. No can do. I'm sorry. Can you ask your dad? Sure, James answers, disappointed. I'll see you on the weekend. Just let me get through the load test. Everyone is stressing. Got it. Hope looks. Hope locks the Porsche. She checks her IMDb for a thumbs up I am review of I Am Love by a notoriously cantankerous reviewer. The blog post offered up a few salient deta details about the actress, Tilda Swinton. Ethereal, perfectly cast, and a thought-provoking treatise on money, beauty, power, and passion. A short trip to Italy for foodies and Swinton lover. One, please. Hope pays her money, treats herself to popcorn, no salt, no butter, and a Diet Coke. That's better than the ice cream she was sure to slip on after skipping dinner. Hope finds a seat in her favorite section, 20th row from the front, right side aisle. While coming attractions roll, she, su she succumbs to a popcorn-induced carb coma. Movies were an indulgence that Charlene never condoned, but for Hope, they filled the gaps in her education. Movies gave her a look at the world, gave her insights into history never taught in school, not to mention a model of love and romance. She developed a penchant for the revivals that played in the next town and sniffled through her t into her tissue through Life is Beautiful, Queen Christina, and Philadelphia Story. Hope shakes off her day, the locker room tears, her obedient Girl Scout to-do list will run the test and it will be fine or it won't. Hope closes her eyes in the darkened theater, letting go of the sadness that had hit her like a sudden storm. She'll watch the movie and work later. It's still early. Now she's going to Italy.
so she's good but she's not all that good so <laughs> the next scene is a short one so remember um she works for a startup that's creating an extreme sports app so very toward the last uh, third of the book the company's going insane because they haven't reached their goal of numbers uh, she's tried meetups, she's doing social media. And so she decides that it's in her best interest to actually do an extreme sport herself. Um, she decides that she's going to base jump and everyone tries to talk her out of it, uh, but she feels that it will give the company and uh, so, some authenticity. And also she feels that it's going to help her kind of work through some of her issues. And uh, in fact, it becomes a very successful uh, stunt and they have 100,000 new viewers uh, after she does this. So uh, this is a short part where she uh, just is getting up in the air. I am now landing smoothly and safely. I am now landing smoothly and safely. Hope repeats the mantra her teacher recommended. It doesn't calm her nerves or steady her shaking knees, but it does focus her brain. Standing at the edge of the Secaucus thousand foot cliff, Hope's past and future collide in a photo collage of should haves, could haves, might never be's. Graduating from Cal, landing her first tech job, the affair with Doug, James, his parents, Doug in her apartment, Kelly, and now engaged to James, a bride-to-be. Has she lived long enough? Has she lived the life she was meant to live? Who knows? Whoever knows how long is long enough? Will she have children, a real home, or will she always wander, searching? Did she plan this jump to sabotage her future? If she dies, she won't have to face the hard questions. Who is Doug Weiser to her? What is money in the bank? Is James really her guy? Remember in the warehouse, Scott, her field instructor, breaks her reverie. Eyes down, focus on your landing, but don't forget to enjoy the ride. That's what you're here for, right? And to fly the flag, Ken, the cameraman, reminds her. Hope nods. Her mind commands her to back away from the edge. She doesn't have to do this. She could walk away. The voices in her head are certainly working hard to convince her. You are surely batshit crazy, Miss Hope, and you are on a suicide mission. The mind, she plays tricks. Scott had lectured the last day of training. There are few tasks that require as much discipline of mind as jumping off a cliff. Base jumping is not for weenies. Hope cringed. Was she a weenie? But just in case, we're here behind you. We've got your back. Hope sucks in a deep breath. Ready? Scott's baritone is comforting. It's grounded. Sure of itself. Just in case you forget how to land, Scott chuckles, securing the headphone under her helmet. He pats her back when you're ready. Hope closes her eyes, whispers a silent prayer, quiets the voices. This isn't about sabotaging her future. It's not about suicide or crazy. This is about learning how to live. She tips her body forward, opens her arms, and kicks off the ledge. The draft of wind that lifts her feels like a hand holding her in its palm. For a moment, she adjusts her form parallel to the earth. Good lift off, Hope. That's great. You've got nothing but net now, girl. Hope trains her eyes on the dusty valley. She'll float for about a half a mile before adjusting the wings for the descent. Whoosh of air. Hope hears the wind whistle against her helmet like the rush of a swollen river. The sound is thick and deep. It's her friend, the thing that will keep her aloft. She's learned about shear and thermals and gusts and the ways she can get thrown off course. A hawk appears, dangerously close to her wings. She marvels at the bird's architecture, its grace. Relax. Scott's words echo in her headphones and the muscles in her neck let go. The sun is warm on her back. Being up here a thousand feet above ground is like surfing a good wave and in a way less scary. She's alone and it's quiet except for the peril of a rogue gust. She can land where, whenever she wants. 
Alone up here, Hope thinks about randomness, about how some things just happen. There are no reasons. Life unfolds. Up here, the need for answers falls away. Why did she sleep with Doug? Up here, she's enfolded in a beautiful emptiness, a quiet moment. Trees pass in a green burr below. Sparrows and bluebirds flit in and above their branches. To the west, a small pond. Trees, hillocks, even the freeway in the distance look heartbreakingly lovely. In airplanes, she always takes the aisle and never looks out the window. The ground feels impossibly far away, but Scott's voice is near. She knows how to do this. Hope releases the fear to shred flag just before beginning her descent. That had the ring of authenticity. Did you really do that? <laughs> All right. Next up is my bud, Judy, who took my seat. Okay. <laughs> Judy and I met at San Francisco State, where she was way above me. Uh, she, I was in the MA program at Creative Writing, and she was in the first class of the MFA, the new MFA program at, at State. And she'd had all these plays and everything. Uh, and she would go out to lunch with her agent. <laughs> you know, but she still was so nice that she hung with me. <laughs> and we had a lot of fun. We still have fun. <laughs> anyway, um, Judy handed me her book the last time we were here for Floyd's Memorial. And um, then I moved and I had no idea where it was none zero i hope to see it one day and then sure enough i found it a few days ago there it was and I, so i haven't read the whole thing but i started reading it but i do recommend it to you especially a part the part about the ghost and their teeth you, this is a very good line uh, i forget that line but it was an excellent line about the ghost and their teeth something you may not have thought about before anyway um, this, this is in this, it, I, I'm talking about the book that she's going to read from today, uh, The High Price of Freeways. It looks at the black experience in Oakland, California, from the founding of the Black Panthers to present day. Uh, she also wrote a poetry collection, which called Manhattan My Ass, You're in Oakland, <laughs> which won the American Book Award. Her semi-autobiographical novel set in the San Francisco Bay Area Black Panther Party of the 60s, Virgin Soul, was published by Viking. And we had fun with that. In earlier drafts, we would sit in my backyard and drink lemonade. Drink lemonade and go over Viking, uh, I mean, sorry, Virgin Soul, Viking Soul. <laughs> Virgin Soul. <laughs> She is also author of De Facto Feminism Essays Straight Out of Oakland. Judy Juanita. Okay. Let me see if I can get up here first. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much um, for inviting me to be a part of this. I'm happy to be here. Happy to still be around, baby. Okay. <laughs> you know how it goes. I went to a memorial on Zoom yesterday and one at one. It happens. The Black House. Allwood and I were the only two beings on earth black guy and black gal in a silver gray beetle crossing the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge headed for the black house in the Fillmore in the city re rehearsing how to say hello and how are you in Arabic we had to be the only two assalamu alaikum Allwood said for the umpteenth time enunciating every syllable wa alaikum assalam I said trying unsuccessfully to stop myself from saying, wow, the Lakeham's a salami, brother, sister baloney, and most high potentate. Allwood shook his head. 
I'm sorry, I take it back, I said. We entered the city, passing the San Francisco skyline, the offices full of yellow light and reflected dusk. All would sighed. The bridge swaying was behind us. We drove to the Fell Street exit and up the hill. We practiced, or I practiced, and Allwood corrected me. When we reached Divisadero Street, I broke down. They won't allow me in if I don't say this exactly right. Who is the boss of Salam and Salakum anyway? It sounds like Abbott and Costello meeting up as sheiks on the street. Believe it or not, Allwood said, you're going to like it. We finally parked at Hayes and Broderick. I looked around for a black Victorian. I don't see it. I don't see a black house, I said. It's not painted black, Allwood said. I came from a big clannish family, had gone to school from elementary through junior high, through junior college in Oakland. Oakland was my solar system. In Oakland, I was at ease. San Francisco was another universe. I waited for Allwood's fingers to direct me. It was a Victorian jammed between two other Victorians. It looked no different from the others, except it was a light green between celery and vomit. Assalamu alaikum, I said to Allwood. Wa alaikum assalam, he said back, ringing the bell. I was startled. A black man with skin the color of a Hershey and teeth stunningly white stood before us. Allwood said the Muslim greeting to him. Yeah, Brother Allwood, the man said. His voice had a tone that registered, registered so deep it actually rumbled. He took my coat away from me. I wanted to take from him his tone, his confidence, his beautiful darkness, something. Is this the sister's first time here? He said to Allwood. I couldn't let him not talk to me. Assalamu alaikum, I said. His bushy eyebrows raised. I'm Janice Hightower. I've never been here before. I extended my hand to him. He looked at it and laughed. More rumbling. Inside me. You niggas from Oakland is quaint, he said. I heard the word niggas from Oakland in a way I had never heard people say them. Did he sing them? Did his voice go up an octave on niggas and back down on from Oakland? His, his voice whatever that was coming from his dark neck, was like a boat bobbing on an ocean. I couldn't take my eyes from him. This is our fortress against the wolf, he said, leading us up the stairs. The wolf? I felt a quivery knot in the pit of my stomach. Was I afraid or intrigued? He laughed so hard, I thought I should stop asking questions. I might hurt something. Everybody, the system, the world, the city, he stopped at the top of the stairs and leaned on the railing. The garbage in the streets, the past, the present, maybe the future. He raised his cold black eyebrows. <laughs> Street niggas come up with a lot of existential rhetoric too. <laughs> Bebo, Allwood addressed him. Your name is Bebo? I asked. What a crazy sounding name. Yeah, wanna check my birth certificate? He said laughing. When I laughed back, I felt like I was bobbing alongside him. Bebo, what time does it start? Allwood's voice grounded me and jarred me. I have forgotten him. The music or the speeches, Brother Allwood. The speeches. Oh, speeches for the good Brother Allwood right in there. The brother pointed to a closed door. Allwood squeezed my arm. I watched wordless as Allwood walked in and the door closed behind him. I heard a faint, high-pitched man's voice inside there that was overpowered by the smell of this Bebo's body cologne, his personality, by his closeness. You belong in here, Bebo said, steering me into a kitchen where a woman was stirring something that smelled like lamb and garlic in a pan. He disappeared down the hall. She was a slight woman with kumquat smooth skin and ankle length skirt draped on her, her back formed a graceful arch over the pan, her head wrapped in a purple silk scarf with pencil-thin green stripes. She didn't see me, and I didn't want her to turn around and catch me staring at her. The smell of what she was cooking, taken together with her appearance, was enough. I was hearing the words, Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves, and Assalamu Alaikum, in a jumble in my head. I felt 
If I saw her from the front, she might spring snakes from the top of her head and twist over and grab me away from myself. No, I wanted to shout at her. No, you can't have it. I turned and walked down the hall. I wanted to find my friend boy. Where was Alwood who had gotten me into this? I had to go into one of these rooms. What if, my goodness, I walked in on somebody doing it? All the house parties had a bedroom upstairs where somebody dumb would happen on somebody not so dumb. But this wasn't a house party. This was different. I took a deep breath and opened the door that had a poster of Malcolm X on it. Maybe Alwood would be in there, in here. Some people think this is paradise. California, we're free. The South is behind us. Jim Crow is behind us. The ocean is our frontier. Now we're a part of the wild, wild West. Don't you believe it? The speaker's voice was high-pitched and familiar. The speaker stood at a podium, two chairs on each side of him. The room had once been a good-sized bedroom, but now there were four rows of wooden folding chairs set up with an aisle about a foot wide. But the room was lopsided because everybody in there was sitting on one side. I wondered whom the other side was reserved for. The men in each chair looked alike, unsmiling with big afros and creamy brown skin. Did all these people have clear complexions? Then I realized as I was escorted with a very gentle but firm hand to the empty side that the room was full of men. My heart picked up a beat and I became aware of my body, my legs, my jeans that were tight and worn through showing the inside of my thigh. You're not a part of paradise! For you, the speaker said, seated where I belonged on the other side, all by myself, I recognized him from the black radicals outside of City College. For you, he repeated with the same rhetorical flourish he used on Grove Street in the middle of the afternoon. California is paradise with rules, a paradise for fools, and the main rule for niggas, that is the unschooled fools who still call themselves Negroes, the main rule is, he broke off and started laughing. He was tall, gangly, light complexion, in fact, pale, like the faded yellow of a man's shirt. In all these lunch times, I had watched him with the Grove Street orators and taken leaflets for fair play for Cuba from him. I had never seen him look jive or relaxed. I thought that guys like him had taken a vow to be serious for all the coloreds who had gone before us and been made into hyenas by mean white people. But here he was laughing, a deep, hearty laugh. I could tell by his entire face and torso shaking that he was really laughing. How could he shake and bellow like that here in this foggy black heart of San Francisco and never have seen that ease even once in the sunshine and touch me I'm blue skies of Oakland? Wait! The word hit the room like a thunderclap. I started in my seat. I needed to go to the bathroom, but even more urgently, I needed to get his point. I was following him, just like I'd followed the preacher's sermons on those interminable Sunday afternoons. Only then I would wait for the preacher, who Uncle Boy Boy dismissed as ignorant, to say something ungrammatical or simple, and I dismissed the whole sermon. But the Grove Street orators were different. They were book smart. That's what the man insists that you do. Wait for justice, wait for equality, wait until he gets ready to give you freedom, to give you justice, to hand out equality on a silver platter. The men started clapping. I clapped along with them. They stopped. I put my hands back on my lap. He cleared his throat like a reverend and went on. I wondered if God awakened him in the middle of the night, telling him what the next day's sermon should be. Only his God would be Malcolm X or Marcus Garvey. His God was definitely a black man 
who wore owly glasses and Big Ben Davis coveralls and carried a briefcase like he did on Grove Street. And his God then probably was light-skinned. All the guys sitting in the room were shades between sand and the shore. Maybe dark me was in the wrong room or maybe that was why I had to sit over here. And then he concocts a rationale for why you have to wait, not why you should wait, why you gon' wait, dig it? He gets some Irish cracker who's been in Harlem probably twice in his whole life to put together a report and put his name on it. Yeah, the Moynihan report. Oh, this sounded like Allwood's turf. Yeah, the Moynihan report, which just means some potato farmer's great grandson is getting over on you, making his name, his rep, paying for his wife to hire your mama to make her dinner and wash her underwear out by hand. Yeah, your mother, we know why sister's hands be so rough and sending his kids to a college you couldn't get into if you had straight A's and perfect SATs. I know because I was one of the first Negroes at Harvard. Yeah, went in a Negro, invisible and all that shit. Came out a black man, had to. It was either break through to my blackness or die. And you see me standing here. The men clapped in unison. When I clapped, I broke the oneness. Yeah, Moynihan, the very name makes me want to take somebody out. Moynihan says the Negro community has been forced into a matriarchal structure, which because it's so out of line with the rest of American society, dig that you out of line Negroes, get back in line. He says, we seriously retard the progress of the group as a whole. I still needed to pee. <laughs> the walls were lettuce green, semi-gloss. Somebody had done a nice job on the trim and the window sills almost alabaster nice. And I still wanted to find Allwood, but the speaker was up to the clincher here in this bedroom auditorium. I don't know about you, but I got a daddy for your ass, he said. This lame ass white man is your Uncle Sam. And the same mothers and fathers he's disparaging, which is a fancy white man's way of saying, putting your ass down, yeah. These same black people huh, are paying his salary, slaving, paying taxes, so the man can write this bullshit, get a PhD off it, and keep you down where you can't even get up and fight because you busy trying to prove to him that what he's saying ain't so, which he knows already, and that's why he puts it out there. So you'll spend the next 25 years trying so hard to disprove a lie that it begins to sound like the truth. And Moynihan, some potato farmer's great-grandson, begins to sound like a prophet. He was through. I had attended enough church to know that. The men began clapping. We don't need no hand clapping. They stopped. And we don't need more, no more Jesuses. One was enough to keep us under the yoke for 400 years. Well, I didn't see a collection place, so I got up and slithered out. Excuse me. So, so I wouldn't have to shake hands with the right reverend. But he caught up with me at the door. Sister, he said, oh, why did I nod? Is this your first time at a black house? Could he tell? Wasn't my complexion as clear as everyone else's? <laughs> Don't be embarrassed, he said. Oh, shit, he could read my mind, too. <laughs> You're not dressed the way the sisters dress here. He pointed me with his hand on my elbow back to the kitchen. Fatima will give you the word. She's a Nubian sister. Queens speak a language only other queens can understand. Dig. <laughs> Nubian, I said. Yeah, new being. Nubian, 
that's the word here. He meant to direct me to the kitchen and I do know about manners, but the other side of the house called to me. I heard drums, vibrations, thumping, somebody blowing poetry like, like a saxophonist was inside his throat. I followed the sounds to a second part of the black house, another house connected by a passageway. I bobbed along, dealing with a ferocious conga beat. That was when I saw dancers. The first thing I noticed was dark, dark sisters, their hair trimmed and moving with their bodies like fitted caps. It was a dark world and I fit, or so I thought until I looked in the mirror where I saw rolling, twisting torsos around me like serpents. I looked like a Tarzan native on a Hollywood movie set. I looked wild and untamed, countryfied. The dancers had sculpted afros. I had hair all over the place. The dancers had African print draped around them. I had on jeans. It made me think of my family though, the side where light people the high yellow side just had to be light. That's all. Be light and that's all. The women who were light, they didn't even have to know how to dance. Just be light, which made them pretty. I knew the browner people in the family could be smart as hell. It was never enough. If you were brown, you better know how to do something and do it well. Even then, you didn't get slack. My cousin Clovis had her picture in her paper at work. I could tell she was real proud of it because she showed it around. But I heard my aunt say, mm, so dark you can hardly see her. <laughs> Fatima stood in the kitchen as if she had been waiting for me all night. I touched my hair instinctively. In front of her, it felt wiry and woolly. She smiled, her face relaxing as if a sentinel had left. You are a queen, beautiful, she said. I don't know what to say. I had been called cute but dark, sexy but dark, even fine and dark, not beautiful. You've never been called that, have you? A queen, she asked, her voice soft and rich. Never, I said. Napoleon Nose had been one of my nicknames from the cousins. I knew I had a small waist and pretty feet. My one physically perfect part stuck at the end of my scarred legs. Men had singled out parts as if the whole me was worth very little, but the parts, singly and in pairs, could be worth something at auction. I never believed men who said I was fine because I thought they used the word interchangeably with the thought of wanting to fuck me. The brother who had called her a Nubian woman came to the doorway of the kitchen. Tight men are up, huh? He said. Harris. Fatima's large brown eyes seemed to pour the word out to them. There was something soft and gentle in her tone, the way she said his name. I wondered if she had been cooking for him. He turned and began talking to someone down the hall. Let the white kids have a palace revolt. Let the white man be divided. Divided he falls, united we stand. When the white man closes ranks is when we should be alarmed. That's when he's at his deadliest. He turned back to me and said to Fatima, Lumumba, Patrice Lumumba. She's got that same steady look in her eyes. She got a chilling thing going down in her eyes. Yeah. My only frame of reference for the word Lumumba was a very dark, very dark as night boy in high school with very African features. He was from the South. He wore big Ben overalls and chunky working man's shoes. And the other kids called him Lumumba. He had a crush on me and my friends had made fun of me because of the way he followed me around. They had called me Lumumba's wife, which I had hated. When Harris walked away, I felt free to ask Fatima, am I seeing things wrong here? Or do I just happen to see mostly light-skinned brothers here with darker-skinned sisters? She laughed, a tinkly crystal laugh. 
She was so feminine. I wondered what her hair was like under her scarf. You picked up on that, huh? These brothers have an elevated consciousness. And yes, they're trying to prove something. Alwood is your man, right? He's my friend. Her long, tapered fingers waved like wands at my words. Harris, Alwood, our men, our light-skinned men in the movement. They feel deeply about us as sisters, as beautiful black women. Well, isn't that overcompensation? I asked. Maybe you could see it as overcompensation. They, they want, most people want a mirror. When you look outwardly, unless you look in a mirror, you can't see yourself. You can't see if you're skinny or fat or white or black. You see the people around you. Whatever they are, that's what you feel you are. When you wake up in the morning, you wake up human. No age, no color, and no sex until your eye hits either a mirror or another person. Then it's instant. That's who you are, who you sleep with, who you eat with. So I think these brothers have grown to resent being categorized put down because of their light skin. They're trying to prove who they are inside so they won't be judged by the outside. I felt a sense of alarm. Then will they dump the dark-skinned sister once they've made their point? She laughed again. Did Malcolm leave Betty? Malcolm X's wife was dark-skinned, I asked. She got a book from a stack on the table and showed me their picture. Brother Malcolm's overcompensation benefited us all. He became as powerful as we are. He exposed us to our power, and that was his power. That's why they had to kill him. She put the book back and walked behind me. Let me show you something. With one deft movement of her hands, she twisted my hair tighter than I had ever twisted it into a ponytail. She pulled me up and we went to the mirror in the hall. I looked at her hands, her long, smooth fingers with their white half moons. They told me my mother had strong fingers with beautiful half moons. <clears throat> Don't you see how different you look? with your hair off your face? She asked me. For so long, I had used my hair as my shield to see myself in front of her as I saw myself in the morning was a shock. You are a beautiful woman, she said, turning my chin from side to side. Look at your face, your jaw those beautiful plains of Africanness. Look at the light picking them out. You're a thousand years old. They couldn't beat the African out of you. They couldn't fuck it out. She wouldn't let go of my head. One hand held my hair tight from my scalp and her other hand, satin cool, cupped around my chin. You have to say it, she said. Say what? I am such a beautiful woman. I said it. No, looking at yourself, not me, she said. I said it again slowly, but it was hard not to look at her. She was beautiful. You are the one that no one can make unbeautiful. Say it as if it meant all the gold in creation was inside your beauty, inside you. I looked at myself in that mirror with her behind me, and I saw what she, sh what she saw. I wasn't only parts put together. I was a whole. She let go of my hair, and it went back all over the place. It didn't matter, though. I was not just my hair or my pretty feet that no one ever saw first, or any other part of my body, not even my mind. I was whole and new, and she had showed me how to see that. Bebo came 
sauntering down the hall. Fatima watched me as we walked away. He wasn't so overpowering now. We went to another part of the house, but he kept talking, pouring poetic shit in my ear. Oh, Elvis ripped off Big Mama Thornton. Oh, the hound dog. Jughead was an agent provocateur for the FBI. Millie the model had silicone implants, but we didn't want to hear it. Yeah. True romance tears stomp where the real ones start. Ike was a colored man. Dinah Shore is a fugitive from the Negro race. Da Sammy Davis Jr. got that empty eye socket from the mob. Little Lana's fat comes from the comes from the dye. Ethel still best draw in all those hamburgers. She stuffs down a fat white gut. Even if we heard it, it would have gone in one ear and out the other. Archer and Veronica freaked on a daddy's bed. You gotta use your imagination. Otherwise, you'll just be thinking some guy is peeing inside you. Richie Rich made his money from black sugar workers in rural Cuba. Louis Louis was a flasher in Krumah has led Ghana into the future fabulous. He walked toward Allwood, who was waiting with his coat on. Allwood looked strange and new, too. Are you ready? He asked, one hand on the door. When we got outside, the cold air, the cold night air, hit my face, right on the spots where Fatima had held my chin. Alwood was looking down the street at the VW like it was too far. He tucked his chin into a chest. I looked back at the White House. Yeah, I'm finally ready, I said. Baby, let's go. The next day, I went to the barber shop and had all my hair cut into a natural. Sleek, short, very African. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a, a little bit of time for, an, we want to have time to buy books, um, but for an open mic, and Lucy Day is going to start us off with a short story, short, short story. Hi, wow, those are fantastic writers to be following, so it's a little intimidating, but um, I think I'll have a seat. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the first page and a half of a short story called uh, Ordinary Behavior, and this was published in a, an online magazine called Amarillo Bay. Reading about Bernard Madoff made me feel really good about myself. I don't mean ordinary good, but extraordinary, off the charts good. $65 billion missing from client accounts, retirement funds, people's life savings. How could he do it? I would never do anything like that, I thought. I am a normal guy, a good guy, unlike that guy. That guy is a psychopath. It was a Saturday morning, and I'd been drinking my coffee in the living room, reading the paper, taking it easy. Cassie, I called to my wife, come here. She was busy at her computer. I don't know what she does there, but she does an awful lot of it. I can hardly get her attention anymore. This time, though, she must have heard some urgency in my voice because she came, disheveled, still in her pajamas, because she heads for the computer right after breakfast. You won't believe this, I said. I'm reading about a psychopath. Bilked people for $65 billion, bought himself boats and planes and mansions all over the world. Can you imagine? Who says he's a psychopath? I say he's a psychopath. How could someone do that and not be a psychopath? You shouldn't throw words like that around unless you know what you're talking about. There must be a clinical definition. I hate it when Cassie gets contrary. Sometimes it seems like she lives to contradict me. I do appreciate it, however, that she has a brain. 
A few days later, I was vindicated. A guy named McCrary, a former special agent with the FBI whose job it was to construct criminal behavioral profiles, was quoted in the Times. Mr. Madoff appears to share many of the destructive traits typically seen in a psychopath. McCrary went on to say that Madoff was sort of like a chameleon. He could change his personality to make a good impression, leading people to believe he was who they wanted him to be, a nice guy, a wise investor, someone who would take good care of them. I clipped the article and gave it to Cassie, but she just shrugged. At dinner that night, as Cassie plunked overcooked pork chops onto the table, she's a fine lady, but not much of a cook, I said, did you read that article I gave you about Madoff? An FBI criminologist says he has the traits of a psychopath. Why are you so obsessed with calling him a psychopath? Because I am not a psychopath. I am an anti-psychopath, and you are one lucky woman to be with a man like me. Walt, I am very happy to hear that. She laughed. I don't know why I wanted to go any further with this, and I sure wish now that I hadn't. I had established that Madoff was probably a psychopath and was still certain that I was not. But I wanted to know more, so later that night, I went to the computer and Googled psychopath, and that's when my troubles began. Quickly, I confirmed that just as I had suspected as soon as I read about Madoff, a psychopath is not necessarily a serial killer. A psychopath is someone without a conscience who might or might not be a serial killer. Um, if a psychopath wants to kill, he can kill and not feel guilty. However, he might not want to kill, or even if he does, he might not do it because he wouldn't want to get caught and go to jail. Um, where am I? Okay. <laughs> uh, the bottom line is that whatever a psychopath wants to do, he will do it without guilt. If he wants money, he will take money. If he wants sex, he will rape. But a psychopath might not be a criminal or even a man. A woman who doesn't do her share of the work, sloughs off at the office while others toil away, might be a psychopath. All she wants to do is be lazy. What makes her a psychopath is that she doesn't feel guilty. That's when I started to worry, when I realized that ordinary behavior can be psychopathic. So, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And if you want to read the rest of the story, just uh, Google uh, Lucille Langday and Ordinary Behavior or Amarillo Bay. Unless anybody else wants to do, read something for open mic, I think we should adjourn, mingle, and buy books. Buy books. Awesome. <laughs> buy books from Eric. <laughs> so thank you very much. I thought this was a fascinating reading. I thought it was great. Very different, each one. Wonderful. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for coming out. Except in front, just in case you want to buy some books from up there. Of course. But um, yeah, all the books are there. Uh, anyway, regardless, uh, thanks for coming. Enjoy yourselves. Thank no you. obligation to buy books. Uh, so no obligation to go to but I will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. This is from way back. Um, yeah, I know you. Thanks for coming.